And thanks to all of you, and welcome. What a good new venue. Isn't this great? I was driving around the neighborhood before I came in, and it underscored something that I have always believed for most of my adult life. When you name a horse, you really have to be careful and give it thought. Because if you drive around the neighborhood, you see that a lot of these streets are named after famous racehorses. You got Bold Forbes, you got Secretariat, you got War Admiral. So if you're maybe planning on buying a racehorse, this is a good year for you, you bank a lot of commission, don't name the racehorse Dave or Arthur or Bert because they're not going to want to put that on a street sign. It just isn't going to work. <laughs> not majestic enough, but uh, beautiful neighborhood, great facility, and I think this is going to be a really good venue for us in the coming months. You guys are kind of in for a treat today because you're going to get to see something that I try to make sure that you don't see often. That being me getting up and speaking with pretty much no preparation. So, um, As Lauren might have mentioned, I was asked to kind of fill in a little late in the game, and I'm always happy to do so, but I didn't have as much time to get anything put together as I normally like. I would planned on doing a PowerPoint, and those of you who know me well know that when it comes to technology, I'm essentially Amish, so it takes me about four days to do a PowerPoint. And that just didn't happen. But I am going to talk to you a little bit with just me, kind of the unplugged founder, you know, that, that method of doing things. And hopefully it'll work and you'll come away learning a little something. And what we're going to talk about today, our broader topic, is the topic of disclosure. And doesn't that sound fun? Okay. Well, let's be clear about what we will and will not be talking about. There will several kinds of disclosures that we won't be discussing here today. The first of those would be those dental disclosure tablets that we were given when we were six years old. Do you guys remember those? You'd chomp down on one and it would make your teeth pink where you hadn't brushed. You guys remember? And they tasted pretty good too, so they were kind of fun. You always fought for those. We won't be talking about that. We will also not be talking about Disclosure, the Michael Crichton novel that was turned into a highly mediocre Michael Douglas Demi Moore film in the 1990s. Because really, it's not unique. Lots of mediocre novels were turned into mediocre Demi Moore novels. So we won't be going there. And we won't talk about the kind of embarrassing disclosures that sometimes we make when we're getting to know somebody, like our collection of Roxette or Ace of Bass albums. No one needs to know about those things. So we won't be talking about any of that. What we're going to talk about instead in fairly general terms is the duty of disclosure in connection with the sale of residential real property, not only as it applies to your seller, but more or less as it applies to all of us as licensees. Looking at this room, I pretty much know that this is going to be review for almost all of you, but I think it's still probably worthwhile. Um, as you know, one of the things that I do in my gig for Chicago is I take a lot of calls and emails, and I write down the topics of those calls and those emails, and it's amazing to me how many really weird disclosure issues have come up just in the last year. It tends to work in cycles, but I've had a lot of phone calls lately from agents and in some cases their principals where there were just problems relating to disclosures or fail to make disclosures, that kind of thing. And I can't tell you how many times I've had to refer plaintiff's lawyers to home buyers who weren't told something that maybe they should have been and decided that they needed to go out and do things the American way, lawyer up and kick somebody's butt. So it is a problem and it's probably well and good that we pay a little bit of attention to it. So that's what we're going to talk about here for the next few minutes and we'll try to get you out of here a little early and you know, but if, certainly if there are questions I'm happy to take those as well. Now we'll start by me asking y'all a question. Who can tell me where we find the origins of the duty to disclose defects in real property? Who knows where we find that? Anyone? I know Ivy knows. Anyone else? Food coma, right? That's not true. You don't get food comas with Chinese food. Guys, it's found in Section 5.008 of the Texas Property Code. How many of you have ever looked at Section 5.008? I see a few hands. That's good. We should see more the next time I ask that question. This is a provision that all of you need to be familiar with, not just for yourself, but for the sake of your sellers as well. And if you look at Section 5.008, what it says is that a seller of residential real property comprising not more than one dwelling unit, so we're not talking about duplexes, condos, apartments here, but we're talking about single family residents, not more than one dwelling unit located in this state, we don't care about properties in Utah, for example, shall give to the purchaser of the property a written notice as prescribed by this section. So section 5.008 of the property code says, you're selling a single family residence, you're gonna give the buyer a notice that complies with the requirements of section 5.008. Now, the thing about it, and this is a fight that I've seen people get into before, is that there are lots of different forms of the seller's disclosure, and we're probably all generally familiar with that, are we not? 
There is the TAR form, and that's the one I think that we probably see most frequently. Trek has their own version of the form, which is a good bit shorter. And then different brokers or companies or trade organizations may also have their version of the disclosure form. They will all cover different things. For example, uh, you may see a form that asks questions that aren't available or aren't covered on, on other versions of the form. It's because that organization thought this particular issue was of, of uh, significance and they wanted to make sure that it was covered. But the bottom line, as long as the form that you're using meets the minimum requirements of Section 5.008, you're good to go. If you are a buyer and the seller hands you a disclosure form, and it's not the form that you would prefer that they use, but it is a form that meets the requirements of Section 5.008. Can you force them to use a form that you like better? No. What would you do in that situation? I'm looking at this disclosure form. There's something that I want to know about the property. It's not covered on the disclosure form that I've been given by the seller. Well, what might I do in that instance? Any thoughts? Simply ask. That's really all you've got to do. And you can explain it or couch it or preface it as much as you want. We're used to using a disclosure form that covers this issue. We see that it is not covered on the disclosure that you provided. I would just like to know if there are any issues with respect to blank. And the seller is obligated at that point to answer you truthfully. You can get the information that you need without starting some sort of holy war over which form that we actually need to use. So bottom line, multiple forms, as long as they meet the minimum, then we're in pretty good shape. So we can't really compel use of a particular form. The second issue has to do with the licensee's duty to disclose. Does anybody know where we find that? Anybody besides Ivy again? So I know you know all this stuff. So that's, I probably have more disclosure conversations with you the first six or seven years of my career than anybody in this business. And they were always challenging and hard hitting. Who knows where you find that? Well, it's in the Real Estate License Act, which I know you probably knew, you just maybe hadn't looked at the Real Estate License Act lately. But if you look at 1101-652-B4 of the Real Estate License Act, makes very clear that Trek can revoke or suspend the license of or take other disciplinary actions against a license holder who fails to disclose to a potential buyer a defect known to the license holder. So. You're selling a property for a buddy of yours in the neighborhood who neglects to mention that there are 72 peers holding up the home, but you're aware of it. Do you have a duty to kind of come clean and disclose this? You certainly do, even if the, the buddy doesn't want to, you've got that obligation. And Trek makes very clear that if you don't, they can take disciplinary action against you. Another source of authority that Trek would have in these sorts of issues is with the candidate of fidelity. And you note if you read the Canada Fidelity that your duty to your seller as a licensee is not absolute. And one of the qualifiers is that you have a duty to treat other parties to the transaction fairly, exactly right. And at a minimum, Trek's going to take the position that if you fail to disclose the existence of a defect of which you as the licensee are aware, that's a lot of things, uh, not to mention a potential DTPA lawsuit and God on throws a treat, but you certainly can be found not to have been fair to the consumer. When we talk about disclosure in general overarching terms, I think the thing that we all need to keep in mind is Trek's position on the matter. When we speak of Trek, we think of all of the things that they do to regulate our industry and all of the things that they do for us as licensees, but let's not kid ourselves, who is Trek really there to protect? The consumer, that's exactly right. So everything that Trek does, whether it's regulating or licensing us as licensees, the rules that they set, is all essentially geared toward making sure that the consumer is protected. And one of the ways that they do that is by making certain that the consumer operates with the benefit of as much information as is possible. So they make an informed choice as to whether or not they want to buy a piece of property, right? So if we're thinking to ourselves, uh, I don't know if I should disclose this to a prospective buyer or not. Hmm, should I, should I not? Well, what's the answer likely going to be? Exactly. If you're even wrestling with it, you probably need to err on the side of disclosure. And if you've taken the CE classes from me in the past, you've heard me use that phrase repeatedly. We err on the side of disclosure. We err on the side of giving the consumer more information as opposed to less. That way they are making an informed decision, and it's much less likely that that buyer can turn around and say to us, you didn't tell me something, you failed to disclose something, which can get us in a lot of trouble. So we have a duty to disclose if we are a seller of property, 
We've got a duty to disclose if we are a licensee representing a seller of property. And by and large, Trek wants us to err on the side of disclosure. That makes sense, right? So when we talk about disclosing defects, what do we mean by that? Does anybody have a good working definition of what we mean when we talk about a defect in property? We probably all have internally our own thoughts on what it means when we talk about a defect. My own particular biases before I started teaching this and paying attention to it would have been things that maybe compromised the structural integrity of the house. If the foundation were failing, certainly we would agree that that might constitute a defect, right? If we've got a problem with the wiring or the plumbing or the HVAC, we would certainly think of that as a defect. Maybe we've got a human-sized hole in the sheetrock in the hallway where an occupant of the home was thrown through the wall by another occupant of the home. Uh, the fraternity house that I lived in while in college had a lot of those. And yeah, they're defects. That's, you know, certainly kind of a problem. What you need to understand is when we talk about defect, the term is construed very broadly. Whatever we may think of when we think of the term defect, Texas courts have given it a somewhat more expansive reading, taking language from the Coldwell Banker Whiteside versus Ryan Equity case. And you don't necessarily need to remember that, but the, the Ryan Equity case, that's the case on disclosure law that we look at as attorneys when we get involved in these fights. And in that case, the court, a Texas appellate court, ruled that a property service or structure is defective when it is, and now I'm quoting, blemished, broken, deficient, or imperfect in some physical sense. Blemished, imperfect. Well, that can cover an awful lot more ground than a foundation that's failing, could it not? That could be something as random as yellow stuff all over the brick from bee pollen, <clears throat> a fence that's collapsing. I mean, there are so many things, even conceivably or potentially cosmetic, that might rise to the level of a defect and thus on some level might require disclosure. Now, am I telling you that you have to disclose absolutely every visible defect with the property or rather that your seller does? Not necessarily. And I'm not going to try as I stand here today to draw any bright lines. I think we could spend two weeks on that and probably never get anywhere. The takeaway for all of you to pass along to your sellers is you need to understand that the term defect is to be construed very broadly. You don't want to err on the side of being overly narrow. You want to err on the side of disclosure. So remember that the term defect is one that courts are certainly going to construe quite broadly. Does that make sense to anybody? Any questions about that? Yes, sir. No, we don't really talk about degrees of defect because the property code basically talks in general terms about defects. And clearly there are some that are more significant than others. I mean, if I've got massive foundation problems, that worries me a good deal. If there has been prior flooding and I'm concerned that there might be mold growing somewhere in the house, that's obviously a major potential defect. You know, maybe a cracked skylight or a broken window in the garage, not so much so, but the court doesn't really differentiate. I think the best you can get in terms of differentiation is if you've got a seller that fails to disclose something fairly minor, it's a little easier to say, ah, geez, shucks, I kind of didn't even know to do that. I kind of forgot about it. Yeah, but great, great No, really not so much. Defect is defect, and if you know of it anyway, you're going to have a duty to disclose it. So just, just err on the side of disclosure. Again, as I've said, Vicki. Is a defect something that's been repaired, though? What if they had it two years ago and it's still there and it's no longer a defect? I'm glad you asked that because that was something that we were kind of segueing towards. Did everybody hear her question? Is it still a defect if it has been repaired or remedied? And in general terms, the answer is no. If you fixed something, you don't necessarily need to report to a prospective buyer that there used to be a problem and we fixed it. There are, though, several categories of defects that do survive repair or remedy. There are four of them, and they generally all begin with F. What's the first one? We've talked about it several times. Foundation is clearly one. If you've done work on the foundation, even though, in your opinion, the foundation may be functioning perfectly well and there's nothing more for a prospective buyer to worry about, we need to make that disclosure anyway because foundation repairs can fail just like foundations can fail and we would want a buyer to be on notice of something along those lines, right? 
The second one is flood. That's right. But when we speak of flood, and dear, don't we know this one well, there's a big difference between a flood and mere water penetration. You don't have to disclose mere water penetration, but you do have to disclose a flood, and it's not always clear where the line is drawn. So the river rises, and water washes away everything on the first floor. We had a flood. Any question about that? We're going to disclose that? Okay. It rains one night. We left a window open, and the rain kind of got in and got part of the carpet in a small area of one room wet. Is that a flood, or is that water penetration? Exactly. The hot water heater in the attic bursts, covering one-third of the house with two to three feet of standing water. Is that mere water penetration, or is that a flood? That is a flood. Now, where do we draw the lines? Again, I'm not really here to tell you that, but this is really where my suggestion that we err on the side of disclosure is a particularly good one. Let's think about it this way. I've repaired all of the, the, the damage done by the water penetration. I've replaced some carpet and some flooring. Everything, as far as I can tell, is fine. But what would a prospective buyer be worried about when they hear about a whole lot of water in the property? Mold, that's exactly right. And you know, mold is an interesting thing. We have found biological fossil remains of mold spores going back millions and millions of years, like back to the Ordovician era, which was a really rocking good time. But in Texas, mold was not discovered until trial lawyers found out about it in the mid-1990s. And so, <laughs> Now mold is a really, really big deal. Here's the other problem with mold. If you've ever been around it, you know mold is pretty quiet. It does not typically announce its presence. It doesn't bark or something. It can be there silently growing and doing whatever mold spores do, and you'll never know. So you can repair a lot of water damage to your property, and there might still be mold going on there, but you don't maybe know that. And, you know, it's easy if the, the tortillas are moldy, you throw them away. You can't just throw away the attic. You've got to do some, some fairly serious remediation. So because you know that a buyer is going to be concerned about the possibility of mold, and maybe they have particular sensitivities in that regard, far better to let them know not just that there was water penetration, but the full extent of it. Does that make sense to everybody? So flooding is our second of the four categories that survive repair or remedy. The third, pretty simple, fire. Your house burns, or part of the house burns, and you do damage, uh, and you get the damage repaired. Well, you're going to have to disclose that. And then the fourth actually doesn't begin with F. It's our good friends, the termites, that's right, or the subterranean wood devouring insects is, I believe, the way that we put it. If you've had termites and treated for termites, the termites are hopefully gone, but you do need to let a prospective buyer know about those things. Short of that, most of the defects that we deal with, once they're repaired or remedied, absent some unusual circumstances, we're likely not going to have a duty to disclose that we had that problem before. Yes, sir? Say you have a Who am I? Tell me who I am. Huh? What do you say? Who am I? Well, here's the thing. If, if I'm the seller and I've disclosed what I know, as long as the buyer has an opportunity to evaluate during the option period, we've done as much as we can really be expected to do. We're not asked to be psychic. We're not asked to know whether there might really be larvae or pupae hanging around in the attic. We knew that there were termites. We had it treated. And as far as we know, the problem is done with. If we disclose that up front so the buyer knows during their option period that it's a potential issue, then they've got the opportunity to check it out for themselves, right? If they are apprehensive about the possibility of termites, they've got a couple different ways they can go. They can just walk away, in which case certainly we're fine. They can maybe have it inspected themselves because they aren't sure either. And, and sometimes, a lot of times, that's what our buyers will do, right? Okay, well, hold on, walk with me a minute here. If the buyer, having been told that termites were an issue, then goes and hires their own inspector to take a look, their own inspector says, we don't see a problem here, the buyer decides to go to closing, when they go to the table, what are they relying on? What you told them or what their agent, their inspector told them? And if they're going to the closing table in reliance on what their inspector told them, 
you don't have nearly as much of a problem even if it turns out that there are termites down the line. So what I'm asking is we were already, the seller were already in the warranty, the buyers, WDI inspector found, said termites. Mm -hmm. They terminated. Okay. That, whatever. But we, the, buyer, the seller had, the people who had the warranty on the home, which is working, come out, they said no termites. There's nothing there. So the company that's providing the warranty is saying that there are no termites. And yes, and also the company that did the original, the, the inspection that for the buyer that said there were termites came back to our guy made a mistake. There are no termites. Well, okay, if they're... You, you tell the, the next buyers, I think you've got to tell them what has happened. There was some concern about the existence of termites. You're going to have to disclose it to the next buyer anyway, right? Yeah, well, what was the termites? We're disclosing, well, okay, I don't, I don't want to get into a 30-minute discussion of one particular... Can I? Here, here's what I would suggest you do. Because there was prior termite treatment, you've got an ongoing duty to disclose. You're with me there, right? So you simply have to let a prospective buyer know there was an issue with respect to the potential existence of termites. We have a bunch of reports that say, no, there aren't any. The buyers weren't comfortable with that. Ivy, would you like to add something? Yeah, I just want to add, when a seller is doing their seller's disclosure and they say, the question comes up, is there any uh, termite treatment? Uh, even if there are no termites, or ever have been, if they have those little things the Centricon stations or whatever, yeah. Yes, there's a case, there's a, a case study. versus Holloway. Yeah, and, and the point that I was kind of trying to make is the issue isn't so much whether there actually are termites. What they're looking for is have there been prior termite treatments? And you've got to disclose that. Okay, Vicki. Okay, well, we're talking about section three of the disclosure. I hadn't really gotten into our walk through the disclosure yet. But section three asks, are you the seller aware of any of the following conditions? And it says, termite or WDI, wood devouring insect damage, needing repair. If you're not aware of any damage or if all the damage has been repaired, you don't have to check yes on that. But right above it, it asks for previous treatment for damage, it asks for previous termite or damage repaired and active infestation. So they cover the waterfront a lot of different ways. But here again, particularly in light of the case that, that Ivy mentioned, Flutobo versus Holloway, which is a pretty nasty case that came out of that Kingwood Woodlands area down near Houston, you err on the side of disclosure. If there has been previous termite treatment, don't try to hide from that because you're not gonna get away with it. They're going to discover that it was an issue. All you can do is do your best to explain to the buyer what you know and let them make their decision. Because again, the way it's likely going to play out, sometimes the buyer's just gonna walk away as was apparently the case in your situation. But more often than not, particularly in a market like ours where there's not just an awful lot of inventory, before they terminate, they're going to satisfy themselves one way or another. And if they're comfortable based on what their person is telling them that there are no termites, uh, you're not completely out of jail free, but you're much more off the hook because you let them know they had a chance to evaluate it for themselves and then they made a decision based on their evaluation. So those are our four categories. Short of that, as I've said, you need some extremely you know, unusual circumstances that might require a disclosure of a previous matter. But those four situations are pretty much always going to come up. So that gets us to the disclosure form. And I think by now, Everybody's pretty much familiar with it, but just kind of by way of a review, you know that section one is just the property has items marked below, and it asks you for features or accoutrements, if you will. Is there cable TV wiring? Is there an intercom system? It kind of tells you about upgrades or features to the home and gives you additional information. Is it central air? Is it electric or gas? Just kind of general information about the property. Section two, asks about specific awareness of defects or malfunctions with respect to systems. Is there anything wrong with the basement, the ceilings, the doors, the garage, the sidewalk, so on and so forth? Section three 
is kind of the meat of it. Are you the seller aware of any of the following conditions? And we've already talked about termites or wood-devouring insects, but they ask about the existence of aluminum wiring, asbestos components, diseased trees, unplatted easements, things like that. And again, that's, you know, you hope your seller knows these things. It's not your duty to fill out the form, but that's where they've got to come clean. And then at the end of section three is a catch-all. If the answer to any of these items is yes, explain, and you've got several lines, you can attach additional sheets. And then four, are you aware of any item, equipment, or system that's in need of repair that has not been previously disclosed? So if there's something that wasn't covered in any of the above, you've got an opportunity to then go ahead and offer explanation. Seven five, or section five rather, is a series of questions. They ask about things like room additions that maybe were done without permitting or ticketing. Why would that be a problem for a potential buyer? If it's not up to code, what might I not get when I move in? Insurance would be one thing, and possibly, depending on where the property sits, a certificate of occupancy. So if I'm gonna buy a property that's got unpermitted improvements, I kinda wanna know about that. And there are a number of cases that say if you don't disclose that, it can get you in trouble as well. Um, common areas, HOAs, lawsuits relating to the property, death on the property, things like that. And then section six, you've got an opportunity to attach a survey of the property, you're not required to, but you can if you want to. How you handle the survey is a completely different issue, but if you want to give a copy of it to the buyer, you can put it in there. Section seven, here's where we see some fights. Within the last four years, have you, seller, received any written inspection reports from persons who regularly provide inspections and who are licensed as inspectors or otherwise permitted to perform inspections? And you can check yes or no. If yes, attach copies and complete the following. You provide the date of the inspection, the kind of inspection, maybe it was just you know hydrostatic testing, maybe it was foundation, the name of the inspector, the number of pages. Now the question I get is what do you do if you're aware of the inspection but you just don't happen to have a copy? You still have to disclose it, right? We understand that, do we not? And in this case, what you do is you give yourself an opportunity to, to make it clear to the buyer that you're not trying to play hide the ball. We had this inspection done on this date, we can't find it, but here's the guy who did it. If you're giving them enough information that they can find a copy of it through other sources, sometimes that's gonna be the best you can do. But don't make the mistake of saying, I can't find it, therefore we'll just pretend it doesn't exist and don't mention it to the prospective buyer. As simple as that would seem, you'd be amazed at the number of sellers out there who try it. And what is your duty in this regard as a licensee advising your seller? What are you telling them about this issue? Disclose it. You're telling them to err on the side of disclosure in general terms, but in particular with respect to prior inspections, you're gonna to wanna to make sure they know that they need to come clean and they need to at least disclose the existence of the inspection. And then there are sections where you can talk about tax exemption. They ask you specifically in section nine, have you ever filed a claim for damage to the property with any insurance company? Are we familiar with that section? I think there are large parts of the state where people don't understand what those words mean. Because it's amazing how many lawsuits have been filed out of fact patterns where the seller just decided they weren't going to disclose a prior claim with their insurance company. Um, you think you're gonna get away with that? Who, who thinks that's a safe ploy? Almost never, yeah. How are we gonna find out about that? Yeah, exactly. If I'm the buyer, and I, particularly if I'm buying with a mortgage, one of the things that I'm going to have to have before I can close is proof of insurance, which means I'm gonna to have to have that binder from the insurance company. So to do that, I go talk to my local insurance agent. That person's gonna run a clue report. They're gonna to wanna to check the property out to make sure that it is in fact insurable. And if there is a prior undisclosed claim, they're gonna find it, aren't they? And then the tenor of negotiations is going to take a very interesting turn. I've seen this happen more than once. And again, here it depends. This is where degree of defect maybe kinds of matters. You know, maybe you've lived in the house for 15 years and 12 years ago, you filed a claim because part of the fence blew down in a storm. You might be forgiven for not disclosing that because that's the kind of thing you might credibly be able to say, gosh, you know, I totally forgot about that. But what if you'd filed a claim for damage to the roof after a hailstorm six or seven years ago, you'd been given $145,000 in proceeds and not repaired the roof. Do you think that will go well for you? It won't, and there are a number of appellate courts in Texas who are here to reaffirm the point, lest anyone have any doubt in that regard. So we make very certain that our sellers understand if you filed any claim with your insurance company, 
you're going to have to put it out there. You're going to have to come clean. There's no way the buyer isn't going to find out about it. If you do get lucky enough that you've got the seller who doesn't make that disclosure and you get that clue report, call me because I might want to go pop some popcorn and watch as you negotiate what happens next because that can be just an awful lot of fun. And then section 10, have you ever received proceeds for a claim for damage to the property and not used the proceeds to make repairs? Same kind of thing. Encourage your sellers to come clean. If this has occurred, we need to make sure the buyer knows about it, and we're gonna have to address this before we sell it, whether it be to these buyers or someone else. So there are some very specific pointed questions here that you know weren't always there, but after numerous lawsuits, that became something that we had to talk about. And then finally, section 11. This is an ad that came about 10 years ago. Does the property have working smoke detectors installed in accordance with the smoke detector requirements of chapter 766 of the health and safety code. Now, if your seller happens to be a building inspector, you're in luck because they'll know exactly what that chapter of the health and safety code requires. Many of your sellers, believe it or not, won't have read the health and safety code recently and thus might not know precisely what the limits and contours and the requirements are. That brings up a question. There are a lot of things in the seller's disclosure notice that when your seller is looking at the notice and filling out the form, they're gonna scratch their head and say, I've got no idea, what do I do here? So your seller comes to you and says, I, I don't know what to do here, I don't know the answer to this. What do we tell them? Unknown. Check unknown. Um, to digress with a little story from my previous life, as some of you know, I was a trial lawyer for a lot of years before I, I decided to, to do this. Um, and it's one of those things, I used to have to frequently get people ready to give depositions. That's where you questioned under oath. And one of the hardest things to make smart people understand, when you don't know the answer to a question, the right answer is, I don't know. We're smart, we take pride in what we know, and so we like to be helpful and volunteer information, and sometimes we say things we shouldn't, but if we don't know, the answer is, I don't know give you an example of an issue that has come up recently in light of an amendment to the seller's disclosure notice. There is now a question on the disclosure that asks your seller to indicate, do you know whether the property sits in a groundwater conservation district? Have you all kind of noticed that? It appeared at the beginning of last year. How many of you are aware of what the answer to that question would be? Is there anyone here who knows how this plays out? If you're selling a property in Collin or Denton County, the answer is probably yes because groundwater conservation districts are statutorily created things, and there's a great big one that covers a lot of Denton and Collin County, but who knows that? Really nobody. So what's your seller's answer gonna be to that question? I don't know. And you're gonna be fine with that 99.8% of the time. Here's why. Most buyers don't care. They're buying property in a municipal area or within the ETJ. Their water service is being provided by that municipality. They don't need to worry about groundwater. This is going to matter if you're dealing with farm and ranch property or something out in the, in the country where maybe you're looking at doing a water well. If it matters to the buyer and the seller doesn't know, what does the buyer do? They do their own due diligence. So if your seller doesn't know, the answer is I don't know. Nobody needs to tie themselves into knots trying to figure out the answer. That's really just the best way to go. It's kind of like I was talking about earlier. If you don't get the particular form of disclosure that you would prefer or that you would hope to see, and so there's something that isn't being answered, find out. You've got an option period, and that's one of the reasons that you have it. So from there, let's talk a little bit about exemptions from filling out the disclosure form. Not everybody who is selling property has to fill out a disclosure. We all understand that, right? There are several categories of exemptions that are set forth in the statute, groups or types of sellers that don't have to fill out a disclosure. The first of these, pursuant to a court order, if the court is saying the property will be sold, the person selling doesn't need to make disclosure. Trustee in bankruptcy, mortgagor or successor in interest, beneficiary under a deed of trust. If there's a deed in lieu, you don't have to fill out the disclosure notice. Um, the one that we see the most often, and the one that I think causes the most trouble and thus the most lawsuits, by a fiduciary, in the course of the administration of a decedent's estate, guardianship, conservatorship, or trust. Very often, we will run into files where the property is being sold out of an estate. The owners were an elderly couple who have since passed on. Their son or daughter is selling the property for them as administrator or executor of the estate. 
The statute says that you do not have a duty to fill out a seller's disclosure if you are operating in that capacity, but is that the end of the discussion? It's not. Here's the thing that you've got to understand. There are two layers to the onion, if you will, when we talk about a seller's duty to disclose. Layer one, do I have a duty to fill out this form under section 5.008? And if I am the executor of mom and dad's estate, pretty clearly I don't, because the statute says I am exempt. If I don't know anything about the property, you know, mom and dad lived in this house for maybe four or five years after they downsized. In the meantime, I was living over in Tarrant County. I was here Christmas morning and a few times for dinner, but I never lived here. I didn't help them with the maintenance of the upkeep. I probably don't know anything. And in that case, I'm not obligated to fill out a disclosure notice. Indeed, I'm exempted, and I probably don't know anything anyway. But let's change the facts a little bit. Maybe I live around the corner from mom and dad, and I have for 15, 20 years. And as they advanced in age, they often called me to come over and help them with things around the house. Maybe at the end of the game, mom gave me power of attorney so that I could hire and pay vendors like the foundation guys that came last year. Well, 5.008 says I don't have to fill out the seller's disclosure notice, but what do you guys think I need to do? I've got to disclose what I know. I don't have to fill out the notice per se. I don't have to use a particular form. But if I know something that needs to be disclosed, I need to disclose it in some manner and preferably in writing so I can prove I did it, right? Does that make sense to everybody? What you don't do is say to your seller, if you are working with an estate selling a deceased person's property, you don't say to them, don't worry about disclosure. You didn't live here. It ain't your problem because it might be that simple, but it very well might not. Does that make sense to everybody? And I will be clear, I will repeat myself, but I will do so in order to be clear. I have seen about seven or eight lawsuits just in my time at Chicago Title that have arisen out of this exact fact pattern. You had a seller that was the estate of a deceased person, you had a family member serving as the executor, and they knew stuff that they did not disclose. And when the buyer later found out about these issues, it wasn't hard for them to launch successful failure to disclose actions. So when we talk about erring on the side of disclosure, this would be a good example of what I'm talking about. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, a lot of the rest of these uh, exemptions aren't things we're gonna see a lot, from one co-owner to another, between spouses or people in the initial line of consanguinity. I mean, a lot of these make sense, but the one where you're most likely going to get in trouble is going to be the matter of the decedent's estate. So we want to be very careful there. Let's talk about a few other issues that come up in the remaining time that we've got. And again, a lot of this is review, but always good to talk about it. I'm selling a piece of property. Someone died in the property. Do I have a duty to disclose it? Yes, it depends on how that person died. All right, the home was occupied by my mother, who recently passed away. She was 94 years old, and it was kind of like the Garth Brooks song. One night she went to bed, and tomorrow never came, natural causes. Do I have to disclose that? No, I don't. Um, suicide. I'm selling the home for the occupant who, beset by troubles, did himself in. Do I have to disclose that? What does the statute say? The statute says no. I don't have to disclose a death. Well, but it doesn't even say in the statute anything about creating a stigma for the property. It basically says, I don't have to disclose a death that occurred by natural causes, suicide, or an accident unrelated to the property condition. A lot of that talk about stigma to the property is helpful, and I think it should inform our decision, but it's not statutory. Here's the danger that I think you have when you're talking about a property was the, the, the site or location of a suicide. You have a lot of people who are moving to Collin County from other parts of the country, or in fact, other parts of the world. We're aware of this dynamic, are we not? Many of these people follow a spiritual or belief system that is a little different maybe from ours, and in some of those belief systems, suicide is a deal killer. The energy associated with that suicide is something that they are not comfortable living with, and there's where you kind of get into the stigma. So I think what you have to do if you are the listing agent is you need to talk about this with your seller and let them know what kind of issues you might be running into. If you're selling the property to, you know, Biff and Muffy Applegate, you may or may not have a concern. They're probably not going to be adherents 
to any particular belief system that we're talking about. But if you are selling it to somebody who may be sensitive to those issues, that's when you need to think about talking to your seller. We probably need to let them know. And if they walk away, we count on the fact that we will eventually find a buyer that is not put off by this. The thing you have to keep in mind, as with any other thing relating to the property of the condition, if your seller doesn't tell the buyer, who's going to? Yeah. So the new owners who are terribly concerned about the prospect of something like a death on the premises are unpacking boxes. Mrs. Kravitz comes over with the plate of cookies and says, we're so glad you bought this place and moved in. We didn't think anyone would buy this house after the hanging. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> All right, now we're, we're, we're cutting up and snarking, but let's, let's think about this from a real world perspective. What might happen next? Can these new buyers come after you, the licensee, or the seller under the property code because you failed to disclose this suicide? No, because there is a particular exemption. But you know where the plaintiff's lawyer, a different species of weasel than we're frequently familiar with, <laughs> where the plaintiff's lawyer is going to get you is they're going to file a claim for intentional or negligent infliction of emotional distress. You were aware of the nature of the buyer. You were aware of particular tendencies, preferences, or proclivities, and you nevertheless failed to make a disclosure that would have been of concern to them because you just wanted to dupe them into buying the home. Now, is that lawsuit going to be successful? Probably not. I'm here to tell you, most of those get bounced out and frequently the court makes snarky remarks about the people who file those cases after they have dismissed them. But the difference between a good lawsuit and a bad lawsuit while you're in it is non-existent. You're still spending money, you're paying the deductible for your E&O carrier, you're taking time away from prospecting, so you want to avoid the claim. And the best way that you can do that is to talk to your seller and make sure they understand the potential issue. The third exemption for, suit, for death accident unrelated to the property condition. I would tell you, you've got to be careful with this one as well, because a good plaintiff's lawyer can make anything look like it's related to the property condition. I offer as an example, we have a lovely palatial spacious home in Willow Bend, 75093. Holiday open house. The hostess is standing on the second floor landing, open below to the formal living room. She turns suddenly to greet an unexpected guest, catches the heel of her sensible pump on the oriental rug, falls over the balcony, and lands on the baby grand piano. Hilarity does not ensue. Do I have to disclose this? I think you better. Because you might say, this wasn't related to the property condition, this was just simply the occupant of the home having had a few too many apple teenies. But the bottom line is, a plaintiff's lawyer is going to argue it in terms of the railing wasn't high enough, it wasn't built of a sufficient material to withstand the weight of an adult female, had it been built differently, we would not have had this problem because it was not, this is related to the property of the condition, pay me. Any communication you get from a plaintiff's lawyer, by the way, it always ends with the words, pay me. They might not be invisible link, but that's always what's there. <laughs> so if we're talking about a death in those circumstances, I think our seller needs to err on the side of coming clean. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, let me see here. Prior water penetration, we kind of talked about earlier. There's no clear way to draw the line between water penetration and flooding. So I think you err on the side of putting it all out there, letting the buyer inspect and make their decisions. Let's talk about sex offenders. I know that we've got a guy in the neighborhood who's a bit of a problem in that level. Do I have to disclose that to the buyer? I don't. It is not an issue for the seller, the listing agent, or the listing broker to disclose the existence of a registered sex offender in the neighborhood. How do we handle this issue? What, who, who's, who's, who's got the duty here? We, the buyer's agent, if I'm the buyer's agent, I give them the link. Yeah. That's one thing you can do. The bottom line is we all need to understand that it is an issue for the buyer. If the buyer is concerned about that, they need to do their own investigation or due diligence, and they go to this website that is put in place by the Department of Public Safety where all the registered sex offenders can be found, or at least those that are bothering to register and update. The picture's there, the information on what they did, and a buyer can check the neighborhood. How many of you have ever gone to that website? It's interesting. One of the things you will find if you go there is it's clearly incomplete. There are a lot of people who haven't changed their address since like 1997 and you're not sure where they are now. Their probation officers may have lost touch with them. You can never be sure that it's 100% accurate. But the other thing you're going to find is that there are definitely degrees of sex offenders. 
And so we have to take the emotional charge out of this issue. On one level, you've got people like the guy that did 35 years in Beeville because he had a thing for adolescents. And then you have people who are maybe registered because of a statutory rap during the Carter administration. She said she was 18, he was drunk, he believed her. That's not necessarily the same degree of moral culpability. So I think we have to try to take the emotional charge out of this issue, but understand as the seller, it's not really your obligation. If you're working with the buyer, I think you need to let them know that if this is a concern for them, they need to check that DPS website. But if you find out after closing, that there is a sex offender in the neighborhood and the seller didn't disclose it, you're not necessarily gonna get anything for that. So we've talked about a few specific issues. We've talked about what needs to be done. Here's what can happen when disclosures aren't made. If we find out about something before closing, and we've already kind of alluded to this, we've got an opportunity to put it right. If I'm the buyer and I learn about the foundation problems that weren't disclosed before closing, I've got a chance to renegotiate that contract. If I'm the seller, what might my attitude be in that situation? Hopefully it'll be cooperative because you've been caught. If you did not disclose something because you were hoping you could just simply get through the transaction without having to do so, and the buyer brings it to your attention, you'd probably be willing to be forthcoming and you'd better be very cooperative or the buyer will within their rights do what? Terminate and are you gonna fight them for the earnest money in that situation? No, they terminated because you didn't tell them about $34,000 worth of foundation repairs. That's not going to be one you win. So you either need to be willing to make it right, knowing that you are going to be suspect with everything you say or do from that point, or pretty much be prepared to get sued. What do you do if you find out about something that wasn't disclosed after closing? You hire the lawyer and you sue people, and that's when things get nasty. The theory under which you will be sued there's a failure to disclose claim under the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act. Among the many things that are prohibited under the DTPA, summarizing, paraphrasing, is this. If you fail to disclose a known defect with the property in this case, because you knew if you did disclose it, they wouldn't buy, so you just kept quiet hoping you could induce them to close the transaction, you're gonna get sued, and what can happen if they find, if the court finds that you did in fact fail to disclose? Treble damages, you can get the cost of the damages that need to be fixed, three times that if you can show it was a knowing violation, and your attorney's fees. Now, here's the thing we need to talk about where all of you are concerned. Our seller fills out the disclosure. We don't fill it out with them or for them, right? That's not news to anyone in this room, is it? So glad to hear it, thank you, lovely. So, our seller fails to disclose something. Our seller is getting sued. You know what you need to do when you find out your seller is getting sued? Call your broker or manager, get your E&O counsel on the line, because you're probably going to get served later that day. They always sue the listing agent and the listing broker precisely because you guys have E&O coverage. They know that they'll get money from somebody if there's an insurance company involved, so the agents almost always get named. Here's the good news, and you can leave on this note feeling good about the world. Texas courts go out of their way to protect agents and brokers. Unless the buyer can show with absolute certainty that the agent or broker knew of the defect and also failed to disclose it, usually the agent is going to be able to get out of the lawsuit on a motion to dismiss or summary judgment. The hurdles that the buyer will have in this case are tremendous. First off, they've got to prove that the agent actually knew about the problem. So if we're talking about foundation issues, buyers got to prove that the agent knew about the foundation problems as well and simply failed to disclose them. They're not going to be able to do that very easily unless you were dumb enough to put an email, oh, don't worry about telling them about the foundation problem, they'll never find out, LOL, emoticon, you're dead then. But if they don't have a smoking gun like that, you're probably okay. Because the courts are very clear, you can't be liable for failing to disclose what you don't know. And second, courts will not impute knowledge of property conditions to the agent. It's one thing to assume that the seller of the property was aware of a defect. It's another entirely to assume that somebody selling the property was also aware. And I found this out in the most delightful and amusing way three weeks ago in JP Court. I was representing a really good agent, somebody that a lot of us know, ethical to a fault, who had been sued because his seller did not mention the existence of a potential plumbing leak. The buyer was so lazy they didn't even bother trying to find the seller. They just had this agent's name on a business card, so they sued him. 
It was a fun cross-examination. This woman got up and rambled and yammered and prattled on about how awful this had been, and then it was time for cross-examination, and I asked quite simply, what evidence do you have that the sellers were aware of this leak? And after five minutes of dissembling, the court told her to answer the question, and she had to answer, well, I, I really don't have any. Second question, what evidence do you have that the defendant, my client, knew anything about the leak? Same thing, she eventually had to admit that she didn't know anything. Court looks at me and says, have you got anything else? And I'm like, no, just tell me when to make my motion to dismiss. And he's like, granted. So <laughs> that's how it's gonna go. If they can't prove you as the agent knew, you're gonna be okay. The problem is you're gonna go through an awful lot of turmoil and have to spend a little money as part of the bargain. But go away with the knowledge that Texas courts will protect you. So the handy tips, fairly simple and I think implicit in light of what we've said to this point, one, remember, we don't fill out the disclosure. We don't help. Our seller does that. Two, we encourage our seller to err on the side of disclosure. If they know anything about it, they disclose it. And finally, three, if we know about it, what do we do? We disclose it. You can never protect yourself from a bad claim or a bad lawsuit. They happen, and sometimes they happen because you're good. You do enough deals over the years and eventually you're gonna attract some shrapnel, so don't take it personally. But if you are ethical and know the disclosure rules and always advise your clients accordingly, you're gonna come out in better shape 99% of the time. That's all I've got, question? Quick question on disclosure. And that is our topic. I probably would put anything that I'm sharing in writing so you can later demonstrate that you made that disclosure. But what I would point out with respect to the substance of the issue, buyer finds evidence of a prior repair. That is not the same in the eyes of any Texas court as evidence of an existing or ongoing defect. There are, I could probably rattle off the names of two dozen cases that stand for the proposition. Evidence of prior repairs that have been successfully remedied does not constitute proof of an existing defect. So I didn't disclose a prior plumbing problem. Well, we can see that there was a repair made to the plumbing system because here's some inconsistencies in the sheetrock. All that proves is that there had been a problem that was fixed some years ago and your failure to disclose that does not necessarily open you up to liability. You did the right thing. You offered them the opportunity to come back and satisfy themselves that it was not a current or ongoing problem. They declined. In my experience, you're always better off making that offer in writing so that if there's a problem later and they come back to you, you can say, hey, we gave them the opportunity before closing to take a look at this. They declined. So always do those sorts of communications via email if you can. Does that make sense? Okay. Anything else or should I let everybody get out of here? because we all probably kind of want to get out of here, don't we? Well, thank you all very much for having me in. I enjoyed it. Be safe out there.